Can you hear me? Yes, you're good to go. Okay. Awesome. So Jenny gave a great um, introduction for me. I wanted to kind of hit that again. Um, if you are listening and you're in 4-H or, you know, horse judging is something that you've always wanted to do, I want to let you know that I have been there. So I started judging in 4-H in fourth grade, um, judged all the way up through high school, and then I went to Middle Tennessee State University where I judged on their collegiate team. Um, and since then, I have gotten a couple cards. Uh, I have an AQHA level one card, uh, my POA card, and a stock horse card. So I judge somewhat professionally now when I have time, uh, when I'm not doing my day-to-day -day job, which is working for Purina Animal Nutrition here in East Tennessee. Um, so I just want to let you know that you guys, there is a business past this. So stick with it if it's something that you love. Um, ask questions, learn as much as you can, and absolutely chase your dreams. All right, so can we switch to the next slide? You guys will have to be a little patient with us. Um, we couldn't get the screen share to work on my end, so Jenny's going to be doing that, and we'll kind of um, be working through that technological issue there. All right, so in judging confirmation, the first thing I wanted you guys to know is you've got to know what you're judging. Okay, so are you judging stock type horses, um, hunters, performance horses? Are you judging mares, gildings, or stallions? So whenever you go into the ring, um, you need to know what you're looking for. Okay, it's probably the most important thing. The next thing is you really need to read your rule book. Okay, so I see tons of people who show horses who do not know the rules for the class that they're in. All right, so imagine if as a judge, you don't know the rules for the class. How are you gonna place that class correctly? Okay, and the next thing you wanna do is know your body parts. All right, so I put a few up here, pole, withers, loin, croup, gaskin, pastor, and heart birth. If those mean nothing to you, then we need to go back and start at the basics, okay? Learn the horse's body so that you can better describe those things when you go into a reasons room to give reasons later after you judge your class. All right, let's go to the next slide. So when we look at any confirmation class, really the things that we're looking for are balance, structural correctness, muscling, and breed and sex characteristics. And really in that order. Um, balance is the most important thing that we look for. So that is the confirmation of the horse. That is how the skeleton is put together and then lined with muscle and then lined with the outside body of the horse. Okay, so this is basically the horse's genetics. There's not too much conditioning that you can do to change the balance of a horse, okay? Um, structural correctness comes next, so that's where we really wanna look from the legs down. You can be structurally correct in the, in the shoulder and hip, but we're really talking about from the legs down. So how is that horse gonna perform when we track them? So as you know, if you've ever judged a halter class before, we're gonna walk those horses and trot those horses, and we're gonna look how they move and structural correctness will play a big role in that. Next, and you can almost interchange these, is muscling and breed and sex characteristics. So for a while, especially in AQHA, muscling seemed to be a really hot topic. Okay, so everybody wanted to turn their horses into these bodybuilders, and we really sacrificed a lot of correctness in breeding just to build muscle. Um, so, We've kind of backed away from that now. And something that I will tell you about muscling when we get to that section of this PowerPoint is we just wanna make sure the horse has enough. Okay, so the horse needs to have enough muscle to do whatever job it's asked to do. Um, if it is a, just a halter horse, at that point, muscling becomes a degree of difficulty. So without balance or structural correctness, muscling is not going to win the class, okay? Muscling is just something that we add on after we have a horse that's balanced and correct. Then we add a higher degree of difficulty if we put more muscle on him. And then breed and sex characteristics, that just goes back to what we talked about earlier. So making sure they look like the breed they're supposed to look like. And if they're a stallion, they need to look like a stallion. If they're a mare, they need to look like a mare. And gildings will look something in between. All right, let's, yep, perfect. So balance is the number one criteria we really wanna look at. And there's multiple ways to look at balance. Um, mainly it's the first thing you're gonna see from the profile view. So when we look at this horse, we're looking from the point of the shoulder to the heart girth, 
from the wither to the loin and from the loin back to the point of the hip. Okay, so we're seeing that this horse, if we were to measure those lines, they would all be equal. Okay, so he's balanced into one thirds. All right, you can go ahead to the next one. All right, so I wanted to put a couple different examples of balanced horses on here. It's really hard to do this online and find the examples that, that really help, you know, explain what I'm trying to tell you guys. So even though there are some issues in these horses, here are some examples of balance, okay? So to each horse, balance is gonna look different. They're going to be balanced and proportionate to their body. So bigger horses are gonna you know, be bigger across, smaller horses can still be balanced and be smaller framed. Okay, let's go to the next one. And then if you're judging in 4-H or FFA, it's very unlikely unless you go and judge at the Youth World or at the Congress that you're gonna see a bunch of halter type horses. So balance, you're not just gonna find that in your halter horses. You're gonna see that in your performance horses as, as well. So if you look at these two horses here, I've got a hunter under saddle horse on the left, and this is actually a professional barrel race horse on the right. I mean, they're both extremely balanced for what they do. So if you wanna take the, look at the difference here, we have got, you know, the stock type horse on your right, and you've got this big hunter. He's balanced in proportion to his body frame and what he is designed to do. All right. Okay, so here's some more examples of balanced horses. Okay, again, we're looking at different horses here, but we've still got a pretty good amount of balance going on, okay? They're equal in the shoulder and the back and the hip. If I were to look at these two horses and try to determine which one might be more balanced, I would tend to go to the one on the right, our light sorrel here. Um, but you could argue with me either way on these horses. All right, and now it can be easy, right? So I can put pictures up here of really nice put together, you know, um, halter horses like the one on the left and then I can put it next to something that has clearly got some structural issues um, on the right. And I can make that easy, right? We can see which one is more balanced in this photo. But it gets harder than this, okay? So it gets harder in terms of if we're judging all horses that look like this one on the left, or if we're judging a bunch of horses that look like this one on the right. So we've got to be able to train our eye to find balance even in those poorer quality horses, because when it comes down to it, and I've got four standing in front of me, I have still got to be able to find the most balanced horse out of those four. All right, and you'll see that on the next slide. Okay, so out of these two, again, these are probably your middle quality horses, but this one on the left here is not a halter horse. It's just a really well put together performance horse. Um, there is a ton of balance in that photo. And again, here on the right, we've got a really nice performance horse, but it's not as balanced, right? So we can see that it's longer from withers to croup, um, where we were shorter in the shoulder, slopier in the shoulder, and um, definitely not as balanced on the right. Okay, here's another example of how it gets tougher, right? So we're looking at a class of performance gildings, and these two horses are pretty similar, right? So again, if I had to choose between the two of these, I'm leaning over to the horse on the right, so the lighter bay. Um, I think this horse is stronger in his top line. I do think that the dark bay on the left um, has a little bit more hip to him, but when you look over here, I've got a nice sloping shoulder, a strong top line, enough hip for this horse, and I think he just ties it all together a lot better. Okay. All right, so now what if we have two poor quality horses, all right? They're standing next to each other, and I've got to pick the best one, right? Because I've still got to place this class. So here's some examples of, of what you could see when you're out there judging. Um, and again, you've got, you see faults in both of these horses, and it's easy for me to tell you all the things that are bad about these two photos. 
but what if one of these horses is going to win your class? Okay, so you've got to be able to find something good to say about these horses and you've got to be able to place them. So if I'm looking at these two, I'm going to use the buckskin over the bay. Okay, the buckskin is bigger bodied. Yes, it's got a very poor top line, but it's deeper in its hip. It's slopier in its shoulder. Just kind of work through these things as you're looking at these horses because you're going to have to give reasons on these. So think about how you would want to tell somebody what you saw in the horses as you're looking at them. Okay, I think that should do it for balance. Let's see. Okay, let's go ahead and see if anybody has any questions on profile view balance before we move on to the next section. Um, I don't have any in the chat on balance specifically, so we'll hold the others till the end. Okay, so we're all good. All right. So balance isn't just if that horse divides himself equally into one thirds, okay? We also look at the head and neck for balance as well. Um, if you look at this roan horse um, on your left, the one and two that is in the red lines, that is the, um, the head and neck ratio that we look at when we're looking for balance as well. So that horse should be double the length on top as he is on the bottom. Right, so we want horses to have a long, lean neck. We want them to tie in high to their chest floor. So on their chest floor, that just means where that red dot is ending up against that horse's chest. And so we'll see some photos here in a minute of what a low tying chest is and why that's not really um, something that we look for. So then your picture here on the right of the sorrel, just another example of a really nice, long, lean neck. It ties in really high on the chest floor. Um, I believe if you were to do, to draw a line on this horse as well, you're gonna get double the length on the top as there is on the bottom. So, all right, do we wanna go to the- Quick question um, that came in as we started this slide. Um, so would you mind to elaborate a little bit more about why balance is important to the overall function of the horse and how that could correlate um, to longevity and appropriateness within each discipline? Absolutely. So when we look at a horse, and we're, we're talking about this term of balance, right? We're really talking about what the horse is made of. So what's underneath everything that you're looking at on the outside. So we talk about slope of shoulder, okay? That's the actual angle that that shoulder is on that horse underneath. So the actual bone on this horse, okay? This is something that is determined by genetics. So we don't create it once the horse is here. It doesn't matter how much riding or strengthening or feeding we do to these horses. Um, and we talk about shortness of back, okay? So again, this is something that they're bred with. And it, the way this is going to uh, portray into their, in, throughout this horse's life is, you know, if you've got a short back on a horse, we're gonna have less um, issues later on with that horse maintaining his top line. So he's not going to get his sway backed. Um, the more slope to the shoulder that a horse has, it directly impacts the um, quality of movement and the length of stride. So if you're trying to raise a performance horse that's extremely straight shouldered, um, you're most likely going to see the length of stride impacted. And not only that, but as we mess with things up in the top of the horse, so we're looking, remember, at the back, the shoulder, and the hips, we're messing with things down in the bottom as well. They all correlate to each other. So if we're extremely straight in the shoulder, there's most likely going to be some severe straight angles down in the pasterns as well. So everything kind of correlates to how this horse is going to perform later in life and how this horse is going to, to age, basically. Thank you. And the other one that came in was, when you discuss how a horse has depth in the hip, how do you determine that observation? Is it the balanced measure in their hind end from hip bone to buttock, or is there something else I should look for? Okay, so when we're looking at balance, let's, since we're on this screen, let's look at the roan, okay? Um, when I'm specifically talking about balance, I'm looking at the three orange lines, okay? So I want to measure from the point of the shoulder to the heart girth, from the withers to the croup, and then from the croup back to the buttock, okay? So those three lines are balanced in terms of when I look at that horse, I should equally be able to divide him into three separate things. When I talk about depth of hip, 
okay, if we just look at these two horses that we see right now, and we were to start at the point of the hip and go down to where the Gaskin ties in, okay, that is depth of the hip. So if we look at the roan and then compare it to this deep muscled sorrel on the right, we see that the sorrel is much deeper in the way that it carries its muscle down to the Gaskin. But they're both still balanced from the side in terms of what's appropriate to the body frame of that horse. Great, thank you, Casey. And I know some of you have stuck other questions in, but I have a feeling Casey's going to get to them in the next couple of slides, so we'll hold them for just a few minutes. And I'm trying my best to throw a bunch of stuff at you guys. Um, so if I miss something, yeah, of course, add it in the questions. I'll try my best to get back to it. Um, okay, so still on the head and neck. All right, um, obviously on the left here, we've got a nice horse, uh, really clean through his head and neck. A really good term, if you're, if you're trying to look for some reasons terms, would be scopy. He's very scopy through his head and neck. Um, his neck ties in really high to the chest floor. And then, so if we look at this, I think it's a pony over on the right. Um, this horse is pretty much all neck, right? So I, I don't consider this horse to be balanced. Um, if we were to kind of measure that neck, it's as big as a shoulder. Um, when you look at where it ties in, it ties in very, very low in the chest floor. So if I were to look at him from the front, it would be very hard for me to see a V in his chest because his neck is way down there. And the way that's gonna impact that horse, imagine these horses need to, to trot off, okay? The horse on the left, the big sorrel, has no neck in his way for him to move his shoulders and move out and do any discipline that he needed to do. Whereas this pony here almost would have to pick its head and neck up just to move its legs. Okay, so when we talk about horses being um, fit to function, which basically means the confirmation should translate over into these horses performing, something with a neck that ties in this low could have some real issues performing later on. Okay, and then again, just another example. Um, this is a very good example of something that you might see at a 4-H contest. Uh, we've got a pretty decently balanced horse here. You know, obviously in comparison to other horses, I'm not sure what we'd say about it. But when we go to the head and neck, we have some issues here. So um, we have a huge crest on the neck, so we call him crusty over the neck. Uh, he's coarse through the throat latch. Okay, so in comparison to our chestnut over here, who's very um, refined in the throat latch, we're very coarse on the right. And again, we want to look at where that neck ties into the body. So Jenny, if you'll click, there should be, um, there you go. So one more time. All right, so if you'll look on these horses where I drew this bar, is where in the shoulder these horses' neck ties into their body. So you can see that this chestnut here on the left ties in really high right above the shoulder, and we're way down low on our, our done here. Um, and again, that can impact performance. When this horse is collected and brought down, imagine that neck dropping even further down in between his shoulders and having to work around that neck to get anything done performance-wise. Okay, let's go ahead. All right, so something else that kind of kind of comes along with the territory of balance, we talk about top line. So <clears throat> top line is really, um, if you want to talk about it structurally, it's the length of the back, okay? So the actual bones, length of the back. And on top of that, there is a section of muscle that runs down the top line that can also help kind of what we see um, on these horses. So if you look at these two here, our horse on the right has actually lost some muscle across the top. So you're starting to see a shelf there. That could be from age or lack of use or, or lots of issues really. Um, but as we look at these horses, we want to see that they're strong in their top line. So Jenny, go ahead and click again. I think I should have some lines pop up. There we go. So we want the horses to be shorter from withers to croup. So if you look at this um, dark chestnut here on the left, 
We're shorter in this line if we, if we draw it from the middle of the withers back, okay? There's less daylight in between that line. Then if we look over here at our done, all right, we've got, I mean, we, we would call this horse sway backed, okay? Again, it could be from age, it could be from, um, you know, just being poorly built. And there's also some muscle atrophy. So I'm sure that there's, you know, some other maybe nutritional issues going on here. But um, we see a ton of daylight, right? We see a longer length from the withers back. Uh, so when you're looking at these things, top line kind of fits in there with balance. Obviously, if you've got a balanced horse, he can't be really long in his back. Because if he's really long in his back and he's still balanced, he's going to have to be long in his shoulder and long in his hip. And what that ends up being is a limousine. And they're really just as hard to deal with as your, you know, kind of really, really short everywhere horses. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so I tried to pick some horses that weren't your typical awesome halter horses. You know, this is what you might see if you go to a 4-H horse judging. Um, both of these horses I consider to have pretty strong top lines. Okay, um, I think if you were to see these horses, this is a great example of maintaining strength over the top. Um, sure, they're probably longer than some other horses if we were to compare them to each other, but if I were just out looking, I would consider this to be a good top line. Okay, go ahead. It kind of wiggles, but I just couldn't get that to go away from my PowerPoint. All right, so now we're gonna look at some poor top lines. Again, similar to what we just saw on the very first slide. I could see these at a 4-H horse judging. <laughs> Um, I have seen them at a 4-H horse judging. So we've got two horses here. Both of them are extremely long in the back. So that's a conformational issue. These horses were bred very long in the back. And over time, I don't know how old these horses are, but I am assuming the one on the right is older. Um, over time, because that horse was bred so long in the back, it has just kind of fallen away from him. So uh, with years of riding, with years of trying to hold it up, you know, they get older and it just gets harder. Their muscles start to atrophy and it just falls down. So both, both of these horses are poor in their top lines. They're very long in the back. This is, they cannot be balanced because of how long they are. It almost looks like if you cut out their middle, it could be two separate horses on each end, okay? Okay, so the next thing that we want to talk about that also ties into balance is the angle of the horse's shoulder. All right, so we want horses to have a laid back shoulder around a 45 degree angle. So we talked about it earlier in the fact that the angle of the shoulder directly impacts that horse's ability to perform. So the angle of the shoulder impacts stride length and um, the ability for that horse to swing his leg out in front of him. So if your horse is extremely straight in the shoulder, most of the time that horse is gonna have a shorter stride length. All right, go ahead and click. I think we'll get some little bars up here. Okay, so slope of the shoulder was something that sometimes can be kind of hard to see. If you've got um, a really fit horse, uh, if you've got a very conditioned horse in terms of he's just fat. Um, and sometimes the thinner the horse is, the easier it is to find this angle of the shoulder because you can actually see the shoulder bone pronounced. Um, so I put some lines on here just for you guys to see it. Jenny, would you back up and remove those lines so they can look at the shoulder after they've seen the line? All right, so I just wanted you guys to kind of be able to see what you're looking at here. Okay, let's go forward again. All right, and I'm sorry that these photos did not show up very well. Here's some example of some straight shoulders. So obviously the one with the letter C on it is much straighter than this one here on the left. Go ahead and click and it'll drop our bars on there. Okay, so I hope everybody can see that. Even though this horse on the right looks to be pretty balanced, um, we're very straight in the shoulder. And really, if you were to draw a line from the point of the shoulder to the heart girth, we're pretty small there. Okay, so the, the um, slope of that shoulder is also going to directly impact the balance when viewed from the side on these horses. 
Casey, okay. we have a couple questions that came in earlier about shoulder slopes. So I'm just going to give them to you in case um, it's a good time to answer them now, but if not, you can hold them. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> why or how does the shoulder angle impact the gait? And are there different breeds that you would prefer a steeper shoulder or a more sloping shoulder? Okay, so it's hard for me to show this because I don't have access to the slides. Um, I'm just basically talking over this um, PowerPoint. But if you look at this horse here on the left, okay, so our, well, I guess they're both base. Go me for picking great colors. Um, if you look at that angle that I have drawn there on that horse, imagine that that horse can bring its leg, okay, so from the bottom down out, and that's the angle that leg can, can hit in a stride length, okay, so that's as far as the stride can go. Oops. Okay, and then look at this bay over here um, on the right. Imagine that the shoulder this, the slope of the shoulder is as far as that leg is really going to be able to um, extend in terms of angle. So imagine that that leg is only going to the, to the line that I drew there on that shoulder. Okay, so obviously we can see that if we were to watch these two horses move, the bay on the left should have a longer stride than the bay on the right. Um, and in terms of different breeds, yes. Uh, for the most part in your 4-H career, you are probably only gonna see um, mostly stock type horses, uh, some, maybe some Arabians, uh, maybe some walking horses, but really any horse that should have any type of stride length, the more laid back the shoulder is, the more that horse can use its front end and get out in front of itself. So. I don't, I don't see many reasons of why we would want a straight shoulder. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so, and then the last part of balance is gonna be our hip, right? So one way to look at this is, does this horse have a square hip or a triangle hip? So as we look at these two horses, um, we look at the one here on the left and Go ahead and click. We can easily fit a square into that hip. We look at the one on the right, and this hip more like more looks like a triangle. Okay, yes, we could fit the square over there, but that hip is more triangular than it is square. So as we look at this horse <clears throat> on the left, he has a really nice slope to the croup, okay? drops that hip really far down. The muscle comes all the way down almost to the gaskin. And he's also extremely muscular from the loin back. So just squarer and deeper in his hip. Then we come over here to our horse on the right and we're a little steeper in the croup. Okay, we have less muscle coming down to the gaskin and it just makes that hip more of a triangular shape than a square shape. So go ahead and go to the next one and we'll see this again. So this does not just have to be these halter type horses, okay? So here's two hunter type horses. I can still fit a square better in our big bay hunter over here than I can even this big, really well-bodied sorrel. So go ahead and click. It'll drop some squares and triangles in there. Okay, so just something that you want to be on the lookout for there when you're looking at the hip. And maybe that also helps you guys understand where we're measuring depth of hip from when we look at these horses. Okay, so let's talk, well, do we have any questions really quick about any of that? Um, yeah, so there's two that came in. Um, uh, when, uh, why do super muscled horses tend to appear to have a steeper croup and do you always want the croup higher than the wither? Okay, um, you do not want the croup higher than the wither. So in that case, that horse is basically running downhill 
and they would always have their hocks out beneath them if they are doing any type of performance and kind of be paddling with their front end. Um, you really want horses to be level across the top. So as they grow, a lot of times they will grow in uh, different stages. So maybe their hips are higher and then they're higher in the withers and then their hips are higher. But eventually you really want those horses to level out. Um, they should not run uphill or downhill. And um, sometimes, yes, you can see some extremely muscular horses that have steep croups. You can also see some horses that do not have a lot of muscle that have steep croups. So that's just kind of something that's structural in there and it just kind of depends on breeding. Great, thanks Casey. Okay, so structural correctness. So this is the next part. So after we've looked at balance, um, and we talked about how balance is kind of being structurally correct because we are looking at what's underneath the horse, what kind of makes him him. We want to look at their underpinning or kind of the leg portion of this horse. So most halter horses, that's kind of what they do, right? They stand there and they look pretty. But the goal of the halter class really is to show form to function. So having a horse that has really good confirmation and how that translates over into the performance world. So I started with the front end and I, I apologize again, some of these pictures are hard to see, um, but I just wanted to show you some things you could see structural deviations in horses. Um, so obviously I put knock feed on here. So if you look at the, the lines that are drawn down this horse's front, that is how those bones should align out of the chest floor of this horse. And obviously these come in. <clears throat> so you can see in the red, the stress areas that that is gonna put on the horse. So that's kind of just where you're uh, possibly gonna see some issues later on in life as that horse is continued to be used. That's where the stress is gonna be put on that joint. Um, and then the next one is bow legged. So these are knees that go out. Again, the bones are just going out off of that line. Um, and the stressed area is gonna be on the inside of, of the knee at this point. Okay, go ahead. All right, so here is something that we see quite often. Um, not necessarily the bones deviating terribly here, uh, not at least past to the knee, they're probably fine. And where we start to see the deviation is past the knee and the cannon bone. And this is a horse you can go ahead and click. This is a splay footed horse. Basically, this is where their toes turn out. Okay, so this is a very common structural deviation that we see. You're good, go ahead. And the next one that we see probably just as often would be a horse that is pigeon toed. Um, go ahead and click, it'll pop up. And this is just the opposite. So the toes are turned inward, inward on this horse. Now horses do not have to have both legs doing the same thing. So I've seen plenty of horses that have, you know, one foot that toes in or one foot that toes out, or, or really they kind of do both. One of them's towed in and one's towed out. Um, and it really does affect the performance of that horse. So when you watch the horses track, um, horses that are towed in will tend to wing out and horses that are splay footed tend um, to kind of step in. So it really just, it all comes back to how this horse is going to perform as it goes into like a performance class or so. So, you know, are, are we at risk of them injuring themselves? Are we at risk of them uh, stumbling and hurting us? That all plays a factor into the structural correctness of these horses. <clears throat> okay, so here's from the side angle, the structural correctness of the front end. Um, if we look at the first picture here, obviously this is ideal. So we're dropping a stream down and it's going straight down through the bone. Um, if we look at one that's camped under, uh, obviously we're, we're, we have our legs set back underneath us. If we're camped out, our leg is out in front of us. Uh, buck need is something that we see a lot. That's a horse that's over at the knees. Um, and if you're ever judging like really big halter classes, say at like uh, the youth world or something like that, as those horses are, are young and growing and their knees are still open, they tend to um, have a lot more challenges there as they put on a lot of muscle to be prepped for those shows. Those horses will actually shake quite a bit in their knee. So they have a hard time locking their knee back into place and it, they just kind of, you know, constantly bend at the knee. 
And in some cases, being over at the knee is a deal breaker. It depends on what else is in the class. But I can tell you that if it's not too bad, and that is the best horse in your class balance wise, but he, he does move in his knees every now and then, don't kill him for that one structural deviation. Especially if he's young, because they can kind of, you know, get a little bit stronger in their knee as they grow. Um, and also you've got to remember, this is the, the second thing that we're looking at. So balance still came first. Um, now, if he's really bad, you know, and it looks like he could fall down any minute, obviously we are going to put him down for that. Um, and then something I see less often is calf knee or that's behind at the knees. Um, and there are plenty of horses who are over at the knees who perform just fine. So just because you see that, don't, don't go ahead and put him at the bottom of your class automatically. So here is an example of a horse that's over at the knees. And as you can see, there's actually a lot of structural issues with this guy here. And this is a great example of the fact that muscling does not win the class. Okay, so those horses have to be balanced and they have to be structurally correct before you can add muscle as a degree of difficulty. So yes, we've got a ton of muscle on this horse. Um, we've got a really good top line. We've got some depth of the hip. We've got a good shoulder angle, but then you get to the bottom half and we've got some real issues. So again, muscling is a degree of difficulty and you cannot just put muscling on something and make it win. All right, so I see some questions coming in on the front end. Jenny, do we wanna address any of those before we hit the behind end? Uh, sure, so we have, um, if the knees have a hard time locking or unlocking, do they have a hard time sleeping, standing up? Not necessarily um, a, balance question but um maybe relevant to kind of talk about how the knee might move if possible yeah so i don't think they'd have any issues sleeping um they'll figure out how they can stand best to get that done but definitely they are going to kind of um i don't know the best way to describe this i should have put a video on here uh they are going to kind of it's like somebody came behind you and kicked you in the back of the knee um, so it just kind of drops your knee out of you. So every now and then, yes, they might have some like little issues where they, they almost stumble. Uh, but for the most part, the horse will perform just fine. He'll figure out how to move, how to walk. Uh, you know, he's, he's fine in that aspect. Where we really see it is when these horses are asked to come into the halter pen and they're asked to stand up and stand straight. So if that horse was in his stall and he just wanted to go to sleep, he's probably not going to stand up the way we would want to see him in the halter pen. So I guess the answer to that question is it shouldn't affect the way he lives his life. Thanks. Um, the next question is, are there ways that the exhibitor can compensate or maybe stage the horse to hide um, any limb structural uh, unsoundnesses or corrections? Absolutely. Um, there are definitely ways that you can make your horse look better than he is. Um, so I would suggest if you're the exhibitor, I would suggest setting your horse up a lot and taking a lot of photos. Okay, so have somebody out there with you, take photos from the side and figure out what is best for your horse. So I see a lot of people come out um, and they've got a really nice horse. So this is pretty much the opposite. So we've got a horse that has no structural issues, but the way that they set that horse up for me to look at creates issues. Um, and so a lot depends on how you exhibit your horse. Um, there, are, there are some things you cannot hide Obviously, if you have got um, real big structural deviations, you're not going to be able to hide those, but you can definitely show your horse um, to the best of your ability by learning how to set him up properly, learning how to uh, really display his attributes versus just taking him out there and standing him up and hoping for the best. Thanks. The next question was, um, for a ex particular example, there was a horse with buck knees, um, and the initial owner had said that it had to do with the bones that grew faster than the tendons. 
Is that correct or is this just a genetic abnormality? Um, honestly, I am not sure. I would assume that both things are probably uh, could happen easily. Um, there are a lot of issues with growing babies um, when they grow too fast. That's almost a nutrition issue as well. We can definitely dump too much nutrition in these babies, cause them to grow too fast, and we can cause a slew of structural um, issues. And the other option would be that they're born that way. All right, and then our last question relative to limbs for the moment. What are your thoughts on windswept legs? Would you put them on the bottom or at least look at other balances to determine how that horse should place? Um, I wouldn't go straight to the bottom. Um, like I said, again, we've got to look at, at everything that's in the class. Um, I have definitely judged 4-H classes where I could have given an entire set on every structural issue that was in the class. Um, so just keep in mind that we're we, while we are looking at each individual horse, it's always in comparison to someone else when we're judging. We're never just out there judging one individual horse. It's always, how does this horse compare to what else is in the class? Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to the hind end, and guys, I tried so hard I could find no photos of a really, like a really good photo of a cow hawked horse. Um, but if we look at this structural drawing here, obviously, again, we need the bones to come out square from the hips. Um, in cow hawked horses, which is the most common hind end structural um, deviation that you'll see, those bones are twisted inwards and the hocks do turn in. Um, and usually those horses are fine. Uh, you usually see no performance issues from that. Sometimes they're actually better performers. So <clears throat> that's not something to worry about in terms of, I just bought this horse and he's kind of cow hawk. He's probably going to be fine for performance, but it's still something that we want to look at when we're judging these horses in terms of confirmation. All right, so go ahead. All right. Um, and then, so here's the other things that we want to look for at the hind end. Um, this is an example of what we call set to the hocks. So basically your horse here in the middle, this is the ideal set to the hock, okay? So we want, if you drop the line from the point of the buttocks down, it would, it would go straight next to the cannon bone and then down to the ground. You'll actually see a line here in a minute. Um, and then the two other options are post-legged, which this picture here is nowhere near as good as what we're actually seeing in the show pen now. Um, for some reason, we're seeing a ton and ton of post-legged horses, especially quarter horses. Um, we're trying our best. I, I hope that we're trying our best to kind of correct this. Um, and then the other thing is sickle hocked horses, and that's where they have too much set to the hock. All right, so go ahead and... All right, so here's our ideal horse. Um, click again, and it's going to drop the line. So as you can see, when I drop that line, it goes straight down. Um, in line with the cannon bone, this is what we're really looking for when we look at back ends. Okay, go to the next one. And here is an example of a posty or post hocked horse. Um, this is not something he's gonna grow out of. Okay, this is how he is bred. So if you're looking at that back leg, I mean, there is almost no set, no bend, no angle to the hawk in this horse. Um, if we were to drop a line, which I did not do, from the point of his hip down, it wouldn't touch any, it would not intersect any part of his leg. Uh, okay, go ahead. And then again, this is a <coughs> not <coughs> a terrible sickle hawk horse, but just imagine that line there, okay? So if we drop the line, the cannon bones are coming underneath the horse and will not touch the line, okay? He has too much set to his hawk. Oh, I did, I drew a line, there you go. Okay, any questions on the back end? Uh, not specifically on the back end. Um, we did have one question that came in right at the end about um, how would you help to fix or correct any of the leg deformities or are these just um, with the horse for life? Most of them I would say are with the horse for life. Um, some of them you can correct with corrective shoeing. Uh, but a lot of them, I would say, have to be caught pretty early. So that's something that 
you know, when they are weanlings and you notice some issues, there's some corrective shoeing techniques that can be done as that horse continues to grow. Once your horse is, you know, fully grown, five years or older, you're not going to fix those things. Um, you know, like I said, some shoeing techniques can, can help them, can alleviate some of them, but you're never going to take them away. Great, thank you. Okay, so next is muscling and breed characteristics. So I, I thought this picture was really great because I feel like a lot of people think this is what the halter horses should look like. Um, you know, everybody wants to have the beefy um, muscle building halter horse out there. All right, go ahead to the next one. Um, and what I mentioned earlier about muscling, the question is, is it enough? Okay, so the horse just needs to have enough muscle proportionate to its body to get the job done. So if we look at these two horses here, yes, the Palomino has more muscle, okay? Does the black horse have enough? And my answer is yes. I think this black horse has enough muscle to go compete, you know, in, this, in, the, in a lineup if we had multiple horses out here. Um, and again, muscling is just a degree of difficulty. So what we did first was we took a well-balanced horse and then added more muscle to him. So he had to be well balanced, he had to be structurally correct, and then we add the muscle. I can tell you that this Palomino, even if we took the muscle off of him, would still be balanced and would still be structurally correct. All right, and then, so breed characteristics. This goes back to knowing what you're judging, okay? So if you're at, you know, the Morgan Nationals and you, are judging Morgan horses or if you're at uh, the walking horse celebration and you're judging walking horses or you're at the quarter horse congress you need to know what the horse that you are judging is supposed to look like go ahead and so if I were to look at these horses here and I am judging stock type gildings I need to pick the horse that most likely fits that category I'm going to go with this black gilding on the left Okay, so I've got Arabian here in the middle, and I've got like a warm blood down here on the end. The horse does need to fit into whatever category they describe it as. So a lot of times you'll see um, stock type gildings or stock type mares, um, or then you can have it, it can be performance mares or performance gildings. When you see something like that, that kind of opens it up a lot more. So basically, if it's a performance gildings class, if it's at a breed show, um, then they do have to be like quarter horse performance gildings. But if it's at a 4-H show, I mean, they can be technically any breed. And at that point, you're just looking for a horse that is well balanced and fit to perform whatever it, it does. So if it's a hunter horse versus a cutting horse, they can be in the same performance class together. And you're still judging the horse that is most balanced, most proportionate to his body um, and just try to find the best one in that group. Casey, we had a couple of quick questions. Um, <clears throat> so as you were talking about balance and structural correctness and some of the other pieces, um, are they mostly quarter horse specific or are there any things that you would recommend people look for maybe as they are judging, say a walking horse or something like that or an Arabian um, that might differ from what you've talked about before? Um, no, not really. They are pretty much across all breeds. Um, walking horses, you'll see a little bit different, but mainly because of the way that they, um, they exhibit. So you can still see cow, cow hopped in, in walking horses, even though they park out. Um, you can still see abnormalities in the front legs, even though they're parked out. Um, really, it's not necessarily quarter horse specific in, in those structural issues. I talk mostly about quarter horses because that is the main horse you're most likely going to see in a 4-H or FFA judging contest. Great. And then um, I think this is a relevant question just across the industry with what um, we've seen, but how do you evaluate a horse that maybe structurally may look okay, but is a little bit underweight or underconditioned um, where you would prefer to see it or what's appropriate um, for that horse's health? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically, you have to judge what is in the pen in front of you that day. So 
you know, there's a lot of times that I see horses that I don't think are shown to their potential. So they're underweight um, or, you know, they've got a really long hair coat and they, they weren't really groomed very well. Um, unfortunately, you're, I just cannot use those horses. So even though you can see past uh, either their, their ribs showing or um, even them being too conditioned and, and you're just very overweight, um, or you can see past their poor grooming, uh, that kind of just falls in line of horse show etiquette, you know, that they have to have some quality to them. Um, so, and, and you see that too in babies, you know, we can, we can see babies that come in the pen and you know that, that once they are through with their growth spurt, they're going to be really nice. But again, you're judging what you see in front of you that day. So if it's not presented, to the best of its ability. I mean, there's just, you can't really make excuses for it. Great, and then one more, um, back to the legs really quickly. So we talked a little bit about the angle of the shoulder. Um, and so we had a question come in about how does the set of the hawk impact that horse's gait? Okay, so <clears throat> pretty much the same way. Most of the time when you've got sickle hawked horses, you're not gonna see much of an issue. Um, Posty legs, you can see um, some shortened strides behind. They're gonna be pretty choppy behind. Um, you know, and the, the post-legged horses though is really a big thing in the halter industry. I don't think we see those in many performance bred horses. You're more likely to see sickle hawks, which you're, you're not necessarily going to see any performance issues from. Um, you know, until those horses get older, and when they're when they have too much set to the hawk or they're posty legged, then you might start seeing those horses get sore in their hawks. Okay, so just you know, for years of use and not being correctly aligned, um, those hawks or are more likely to get sore, and you have some issues in the hawk later on. Great, thank you. Okay, so I put some practice horses on here. I know we're getting close to time. So there's just a few here and then I've got a class really quick for everybody to judge. Um, like I said, it's kind of hard to pick photos online and actually, you know, really get across what I'm trying to say. But if we were to look at these two horses and we were to pick which one was more balanced. Okay, so there's a lot of things I can talk about these two, uh, you know, our our sorrel on the right, he's got more quality, more show ring presence. He's got more bloom. Um, our Palomino, you know, here, here's a great example of how they're presented, okay? So if these two horses were standing next to each other in a pen, it would be very hard for me to use the Palomino over this sorrel just in the way he's standing, okay? So show your horse, um, you know, raise this Palomino's head up. It's going to help make it look like his neck doesn't tighten so low to his chest, um, it's going to make help him look like he's not so downhill. You can see he does run downhill. His hips are just a little bit taller than his withers. You know, that could be because he's growing. I don't know how old this horse is, but I still have to look at what I'm judging right now. Um, and so if I had to pick which one was more balanced, I'm going to go over here with the sorrel. Now, I didn't say anything about legs. You know, obviously our sorrel's got some issues in the legs, but just on balance, we're going to choose the sorrel. Okay, go ahead. All right, looking at balance again. All right, we've got two really nice horses here. Okay, and when I look at these initially, my eye is drawn to the black horse. Okay, he's got he's out in the sun, he's got a ton of bloom and shine on him, and he's heavy muscled. But when I actually break it down and look at which horse is more balanced, I'm apt to choose the sorrel. Okay, if we look at the top line, I think the sorrel is much shorter in her top line. Um, I like the slope to her croup. I like how deep she is in her hip. Even though she's not as heavily muscled, she's muscled appropriate to her body. Okay. And then we talked about, you know, having a refined head and neck, not being coarse. Um, so if we look at these two horses, both pretty balanced. If I had to choose between the two of these, I'm going to the Palomino. Okay, so our Palomino has a really attractive head and neck, a very eye appealing face, um, is very trim through the throat latch, clean in her neck, she, her neck ties in very high at her chest floor. And then if we look over at the paint, um, you know, I, I'm not overly attracted to his head. 
Uh, he's very coarse in his throat latch. His neck ties in lower. Um, he's shorter in the neck. If I wanted to compare their balance, um, I think the Palomino is a little shorter in the back, uh, but the paint has a deeper hip. So I'm still, in terms of which horse is more refined, our Palomino is the winner here. Um, and this is also another example. Let's look at the hawks on these two horses. Our Palomino is a little posty, where our paint is a little sickle hawk. So, you know, with them both having a hawk issue, that's not going to play any, any difference in, in my decision. So, okay. Um, here's a view from the front. We're looking at these horses and how the bone comes out of the shoulder. As you can see, the horse on the left, our bay horse here, our knees uh, come together just a little bit. So imagine drawing a line from the shoulder down. Those cannon bones are not going to hit in that line. Um, and then if we look over here in our sorrel or our chestnut, we're a lot straighter. It's not a perfect picture, so I'm not really sure, but I believe that line would fall much straighter down the center of that horse's knee and cannon bone. Okay. All right, so here again, we've got which horse is more correct in the set of their hawk. Um, our roan here is pretty ideal. We're a little sickle hawked here in our bay. Um, not enough to ever perfect to affect this horse's performance, but if we're nitpicking, so if we're coming down, like we've got two horses that are exactly the same and I've got to find some way to tear these two apart, then we can look at things like this. All right, and so I know this horse on the left is, is performing a showmanship maneuver, but just try to look at their overall body. Um, this is what you might see if you've got a bunch of hunter horses in your halter class, uh, and it does happen. So if we're looking at the two of these, again, we are still looking for balance. So they both have triangular shaped hips, right? Um, they're both kind of shorter in their shoulder, straighter in their shoulder. Um, our sorrel here is extremely straight in the shoulder. So if you look at that angle, it is almost straight up and down. And in fact, if you look at the opposite leg in this photo, that's a great example of how sho uh, shoulder slope affects the stride of that horse. So if you look at the slope of the shoulder, it is almost exactly in how that horse would um, use his stride in the leg. So of these two horses, which one is more correct? We're definitely going over here with the bay. The bay has a lot of scope to his head and neck, very clean through his throat latch. He's shorter in his back, cleaner across the top. Um, definitely going towards the bay. Okay, and so now I've got a class of performance gildings. Okay, this is tough, guys. So I picked, um, this, is, this is a pretty hefty group of performance horses here um, from all across the board. There's some hunter horses, there's some uh, racing horses, there's some pleasure horses in here. This is what you would typically see in a performance halter class. So just a little bit of everything. Um, so Jenny, if you wanna click through this kind of slowly, it'll give a bigger view of everybody and then it will come back and do a view of all four horses. I'm gonna give like 10 seconds on each picture. Is that okay, Casey? Yep, that's fine. Okay, so let's leave it on this screen for just a moment and let everybody get a really good look. While we're giving them a minute, Casey, would you mind to describe a little more about what you mean when you say scope to the neck? Yes, so scope is a term that we really use um, for horses that are going over fences. So we've all seen those hunter under saddle horses that are very level in their top line um, you know 
they're, they're trotting beautifully around, but their head and neck is kind of down in between their shoulders. Um, so when we talk about scope to the neck, it's really that horse lifting up through their neck, almost like they're ready to, um, you know, take the jump. And as they go over the jump, the rounding that happens in their head and neck and in their spine, um, and that's something that can translate to what we what we see in these horses when we're looking at them conformationally. Um, it's it's kind of just like a uh, a really nice term to say they've got a, a really pretty uh, head and neck that's very clean and trim. And then um, one more question just about general conformation. <clears throat> um, when the horse has sickle hocks, will it damage all of the legs or just the showing of standing? It does not damage all of the legs, no. If that is if that answers the question. Um, you know, horses can have structural deviations in the front end and the back end, or they can have one or the other, you know, or they can just have one leg that is deviated and everything else can be fine. Um, so no, it's, it's not going to affect, it's just gonna affect the, the, the view of that horse from the side and, um, you know, when we compare it to other horses. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so if we were looking at these four horses, and like I said, this is really tough, okay? So this is a really tough performance class. Um, and I want to just go ahead and say, nobody in here has perfect legs, okay? So we, this is a really good class where we're really looking for balance, because if we judged everybody on the bottom half, nobody's, nobody's perfect here. So I guess that's another really good point to make. Don't nitpick, okay? Step back from the horses, get a big general overview, and don't pick horses apart when they don't need to be. So as we look at these guys, I find two horses that stand out to me very quickly, and they are my top and my bottom place horses. My top place horse is number one, okay? Again, not perfect here. Yes, he's a little crusty on the neck. He happens to be a, a breeding stallion. Yes, he has a little set to his hock, but if I'm looking at overall balance and muscling and structural correctness and how they blend together, I think this horse is a really great blend of those three things. I think he ties it all together the best. Okay, then the next horse I easily found when I looked at this was two. Okay, and two is the bottom horse for me. So in comparison to everybody else on here, two seems to be kind of long overall, kind of long and lean. Um, we are longer in our back, we're shorter in our shoulder, we're straighter in our shoulder. It just doesn't quite seem to have the conditioning that everybody else does in this class. So that was easy for me, okay? And there's lots of good things that I can say about two. But for this class here, I found one at the top and two at the bottom. And then when you get into this middle pair here, you could, this is where reasons are so important, okay? You can tell me very easily why you place one of these over the other and I am I'm all for it. I put a one point cut in this pair, I think, um, because I do think that they're really close. I personally went with the sorrel over the bay. Um, I think that the sorrel, again, just kind of blends everything very harmoniously, uh, a little cleaner in our head and neck and where it ties into the body and how we carry that back through. Um, but then again, this bay has got a lot of body, a lot of depth, a lot of heart girth. You know, we're, we're really deep in our hip. We're strong enough over our top line. So maybe we're longer in the top line, but I think this bay is strong enough that if you wanted to tell me that, I, I'm okay with it. Um, and then I do think the bay is slopier in their shoulder or in his shoulder. So reasons are very important as it comes to that middle pair. Okay, so if I was going to talk this class, obviously I'm going to talk one as being the most harmoniously blended horse in there who best combines confirmation, structural correctness, and muscling. Okay, and then I'm going to talk three and four and however you choose to put it. And then I'm going to talk two. And I'm, I'm not going to just put two down. You know, he had this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. Um, you know, two is competitive in this class. 
However, in compared to the other horses that placed above him today, uh, you know, he just really finds himself in the bottom hole. Okay, so I'm sure there's a million questions now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Casey. I think um, between Jeffrey um, and the ones that you've answered live, we've gotten most of the chat um, cleaned up. And so um, the only ones that we have left in here that we have not um, talked about um, more specifically is um, when evaluating balance, do you prefer the horse's head to be higher or lower? Um, and then how do you determine what the appropriate set would be? Okay, so I think that means how to set the horse up. Um, and that's gonna go back to taking photos, okay? So if you set your horse up and you step back and you take a photo, and your horse is camped under or camped out or he's got his hock set way out behind him then obviously you're going to have to adjust that um so you're just going to have to set your horses up as much as you possibly can and learn how to best show your horse um, in terms of the head and neck most of the time they're going to look a lot better with their head up um, the only time I've seen that kind of work against someone is if your horse is extremely long in the back and you pull their head up, a lot of times they can um, kind of get weak in their top line. So again, step back, take photos, learn the best way to show your horse. Thanks. Um, the next one is when you say that gelding should look like geldings or mares should look like mares, could you give us some examples outside of just their head um, for what to look for that would make them more sex specific? Um, well, there's not, there's not too much. Uh, mares, I think, tend to be a little bit more refined. So we'd like them to be uh, less coarse throughout their body. Um, and gildings, gildings kind of fall in between. You know, stallions, we like to see them a little, if, if there was a stallion and a mare in a class together, we would expect the stallion to be heavier muscled. Um, we would expect him to have a more pronounced jaw um, compared to a mare who's more refined and feminine in the head. Uh, and your gilding is just, he is really a mix between the two. Um, and there's not much in their body type that you're going to see besides genitalia. Um, and in most 4-H classes, you're never going to have to worry about that. In fact, there will be some classes where you might judge mares and gildings together but always listen to your announcer and listen to the fact, um, they'll tell you that, you know, all the horses are, are judged as sound or judged as um, mares or gildings. Um, always listen for something like that. But other than that, no, there's not too much to, to see a difference in. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, we can clean up the rest of um, the chat questions here really quickly, but um, we'd like to say thanks to Casey for sharing um, part of her afternoon with us um, for week two of the Horse Judging from Home webinar series. And just as a reminder, next week um, we will be discussing gated horses with Jeffrey Hester um, at the same time from 2 p.m., uh, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, um, next Tuesday, April 14th. Um, so thank you guys again for joining us today. Um, feel free to hop off. Um, if you haven't thrown a question in the chat yet, and then we will clean up the rest here and see you guys next week. Thanks so much.